speaking of liberty. The National Broadcasting Company takes pleasure in presenting the third in a new series of programs under the auspices of the Council for Democracy. Once again, we have a period of free talk on the air. Once again, our host is Rex Stout, who most of you already know is the author of baffling mystery stories, featuring the solutions of that corpulent criminologist extraordinary, Nero Wolfe. Well, on these programs, you will come to know Rex Stout even better as an outspoken champion of our American democracy. We present again, Mr. Stout. Thank you, George Putnam. Good evening, friends of liberty and enemies, for there are some in America today as there were in the days of our grandfathers, the days of Abraham Lincoln. If any American ever had cause to despair of the functioning of democracy in a crisis, Lincoln had. He even had to sneak surreptitiously into Washington for his inaugural, and what a Washington that was. Margaret Leach has written a book about it. The book, Reveille in Washington, is a national bestseller, and Margaret Leach is our guest today. Having read the book and knowing that she spent five years working on it, I regard her with awe and admiration. Oh, come, Mr. Stout. It wasn't as bad as all that. It must have been bad enough, Miss Leach, to spend five years as you did back in the Washington of 1860-65, that pestilential conglomeration of adventurers, appeasers, crooks, spies, traitors, chiseling contractors and politicians, job hunters, and we're making it too thick. Well, you haven't described the entire population, but all you have described were certainly there. They certainly were. I met them in your book. I would think that your research for it might have given you cause to despair of the functioning of democracy in a crisis, did it? Well, on the contrary, Mr. Stout, I have an even stronger faith in our form of government than I had before. You see, I found out that democracy was tough. It can survive a lot. I'm afraid this sort of talk bores a good many people. They're suspicious of optimism, just as people were in the winter of 1860-61. If you so much as drop a hint of hope for the future, they accuse you of overconfidence. They say that confidence is more dangerous than defeatism. Personally, I don't believe it. Good for you. And another ten minutes in the Washington of 1860 can't hurt you. What sort of place was it, Miss Leach? Well, Mr. Stout, it was just what you called it a moment ago, and much more. It was full of treason and dissension. You see, Washington wasn't really a capital in the European sense of the word at all. It wasn't the greatest and oldest city of the country or the center of its culture or its national feelings. It was just a place for the government. Yes. Even in 1860, it was still not very much more than a small town. A slaveholding town, lying sprawled around a few new federal buildings in a muddy valley beside the Potomac. Pennsylvania Avenue had big new ugly hotels on one side and scattered shacks on the other. In between, the thoroughfare was knee-deep in mud in winter and a forecast of the dust bowl in summer. And the population was about as heterogeneous as the streets and buildings, wasn't it? Well, most people in Washington sympathized with the South. There were a good many rabid secessionists, a small number of loyal unionists, but very few who welcomed the arrival of the prairie lawyer from Illinois, the first Republican president. Were the inhabitants of Washington actually hostile to Lincoln? Some of them were. But during the winter that preceded Lincoln's inauguration, the people of Washington had been badly frightened. They saw men in high office who were determined on the destruction of the national authority. They heard threats that the city would be seized and made the capital of a southern confederacy. They saw guards around the unfinished capitol building. Over their whiskey at Willard's Bar, clerks in the government departments were boasting that Abraham Lincoln would never be inaugurated. Well, how far had the secession movement gone before Lincoln reached Washington? Far enough to make the situation appear almost hopeless. Of course, Lincoln's election had inflamed the South. Before Christmas, South Carolina had seceded. By the time Lincoln took office in March, seven states had withdrawn from the Union. It certainly was hopeless. The world's greatest democratic structure split wide open and the fragments full of cracks. That was just the way people looked at it, Mr. Stout. To men who loved the Union, the secession movement seemed to violate a fundamental principle of democratic government the principle that the minority should submit to the majority. And in Europe, of course, people were smiling and shrugging. Secession to them forecast the failure of the experiment called democracy. It couldn't stand up under the first really deep divergence of interest and opinion. It certainly looked like it. You speak about the men who loved the Union, Miss Leach. You don't mean to say that devotion to the Union was confined wholly to the North, do you? Oh, no, Mr. Stout. Of course, there were thousands of Southerners who didn't want to see the Union destroyed. But Southerners had a very strong tradition of state loyalty. Take Lee, for example. Lee was a colonel in the United States Army. 
He believed secession to be revolution and anarchy. After Fort Sumter surrendered in April of 1861, he was offered the command of the forces of the Union. But Virginia seceded a few days later, and Lee offered his sword to his state. Well, what was the reaction in the North to the news that the <coughs> seceded states were preparing for war? Well, Northern men simply wouldn't listen. They didn't want war. Talk of war was just an alarmist rumor that did the country no good. The northern states were so apathetic and divided that patriotic feeling seemed almost dead. Some men who a year or two later would die to preserve the Union were willing in 1861 to see the United States split in two rather than bring on civil war. Others were willing to make any concession to southern demands in order to keep the Union together. And then the crisis had brought on a severe depression. All over the North, businessmen were clamoring for peace and quiet and prosperity. And it was in that atmosphere that Lincoln went to Washington, stealthily, by night, determined to save the Union. How did he go about it? Naturally, he wanted to avoid taking any steps that might bring on war. But down at Fort Sumter in Charleston Harbor, a small federal garrison was running short of food. Lincoln had to decide whether to let them be starved into surrender or send them supplies and take the chance that South Carolina would start shooting. It was April before he could make up his mind. Well, that was before the bombardment of Sumter. Yes. The relief ship which he sent precipitated the bombardment just as he had feared. But he had decided that failure to assert the federal authority meant national destruction. And when Sumter was shelled into surrender... Lincoln called for 75,000 volunteers for three months' service. The response was overwhelming. Overnight, the men of the North threw off their lethargy, cheered and waved flags, and crowded the enlistment officers. Including the menagerie in Washington? What about Washington? Well, Mr. Stout, Washington was appalled. Virginia went with the South. Mobs in Baltimore attacked a Massachusetts regiment on its way to Washington, and the railroads to the North were cut. For six days, the capital was cut off from the loyal states, surrounded by enemies and entirely defenseless. Then the 7th New York Regiment arrived, and thousands of volunteers from all over the North came hurrying behind The 7th New York, that was a crack outfit, wasn't it? Oh, yes. The New York boys had beautiful uniforms and velvet-covered camp stools and sandwich lunches put up by Delmonico's. Their morale was good, and they set a beautiful example, but they had enlisted only for 30 days, and when their time was up, they went back to New York. Now, speaking of liberty, Miss Leach, before they'd ever fought a battle? Oh, that was typical of what Lincoln had on his hands, Mr. Stout. You see, he'd only called out troops for three months, and when their time was up, they went home, war or no war. Well, what about the regular army? Well, it was regular, but it numbered only about 16,000 men. They were commanded by General Winfield Scott, who had fought in the War of 1812. Most of them were scattered in frontier stations in the West. Scott could only gather together eight companies of regulars to preserve order in Washington at the time of Lincoln's inauguration. But that wasn't all. Not only was the army pitifully small, but most of its best officers were Southerners. And when the crisis came, the Southerners went with their states. Almost all. Scott was a Virginian, but he was loyal to the Union. Also, he was 75 years old, had gout, dysentery, heart trouble, dropsy, and couldn't mount a horse. Uh, didn't the North have any officers who were in slightly better condition than that? Yes, but they were inexperienced in war, and it was hard to pick the good ones. Scott had always favored Southerners, and many able Northern graduates of West Point had grown discouraged and left the service. In the first year of the war, Grant and Sherman and Sheridan were practically unknown officers. And, of course, the militia regiments had officers who were not officers at all. How do you mean, not officers? Why, most of them had no training or experience of any kind. The colonels were usually political appointments, and the junior officers were elected by their own men. The whole weakness of the northern war effort was shown up at Bull Run. The men and most of the officers were untrained, and their guns were mainly clumsy muskets that dated from the Revolution. Well, if you wanted to distribute blame, you'd have to start higher up in the offices. Of course, Mr. Stout, the War Department was greatly at fault. It was utterly unprepared for the emergency. Each time a new regiment arrived in Washington, it was treated like an unexpected guest for whom no preparations had been made. Quantities of supplies were needed. Tents, cots, guns, uniforms, stoves, shoes, on a scale beyond the wildest dreams of men who'd spent their lives tying bows on red tape. And in addition to that, Washington was filled with spies who kept the South informed of everything. 
from the general lack of preparation to precise details of the federal plans of campaign. With all that, it seems impossible that even a Lincoln could carry on. There must have been moments when Lincoln wondered if democracy could possibly pull through. When even he felt like saying, it's no good, it's done, it won't work. But he never said it. And I haven't begun to describe what Lincoln faced. We've been talking mostly about the army, but the same faults were characteristic of the whole North. No one had planned ahead. People weren't disciplined to a united war effort. The draft, when it came, was full of inequality. The copperheads and doubters and appeasers cried down the war and spread all sorts of stories and rumors. And Lincoln had to contend with all that in addition to building an army and saving the Union. And didn't people accuse him of assuming the powers of a dictator? Oh, yes. Even the leaders of his own party accused him of that. They said he was breaking down the Constitution and concentrating all authority in the executive branch of the government. On the other hand, the politicians were in constant fear of military dictatorship as well. They thought that a huge army could never be peacefully absorbed when the war was over. Yeah, that kind of people always have said and always will say that kind of thing. But to stick to Lincoln and the Washington of 80 years ago, when did they wake up? There was certainly a change in the feeling about Lincoln from the distrust of 61 to the adoration of 65. Well, Lincoln was feared and hated by the radical leaders of the Republican Party right up to his death. They did their best to prevent his renomination. But the people had gradually come to believe in Lincoln and in his devotion to the Union. What made people finally buckle down to fighting the war in earnest? Some awakening came after the defeat at First Bull Run. People were shocked into seeing that the spirit of Lexington wasn't enough. The Union volunteers were brave and patriotic, but they had to be trained and organized and equipped. After the victories of Gettysburg and Vicksburg, in spite of copperheads and peacemakers, there was a growing confidence in the country. <clears throat> the Emancipation Proclamation had met with a cold reception at first, but it became increasingly popular. The relation of slavery to the war no longer seemed remote. The nation was disillusioned, it had lost its capacity for easy optimism, but it had learned to hold a grim and steadfast resolve. Democracy survived its weaknesses and grew strong. The job was always hard and never perfectly accomplished, but the men of the Union finally proved, to themselves and for all time, that democracy could function in a great national crisis and win a war. For all time? I don't know. I would say that each generation of a democracy, a land of liberty must do its own job and furnish its own proofs. The generation of our grandfathers certainly did both. Thank you, Miss Leach. Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today has been Margaret Leach, author of Reveille in Washington, a book of the month. This is Rex Stout saying goodbye until next week. You have just heard the third of another series of programs entitled Speaking of Liberty, brought to you each week by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with the Council for Democracy a national organization dedicated to the propagation of an American faith in democracy. Next week, Rex Stout will bring to the microphone Thornton Wilder, just returned from England. A copy of the script of this broadcast will be mailed absolutely free to anyone requesting it. Please address your letter or card to the Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. The address again is Council for Democracy, 285 Madison Avenue, New York City. Speaking of Liberty has been presented as a public service by NBC and the independent radio stations associated with the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company. This evening's program has come to you from the RCA Building, Radio City, New York.